Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Office Hours, where we get to sit down with the brightest minds in B2B sales and marketing, and they get to share with us lessons that they've learned outside of the classroom to build more relatable and authentic brands. Now, I'm really excited for today's session because we're going to be talking about all things account-based marketing and events. And now, in my experience, account-based marketing means different things to different organizations in terms of whatever's relative to your success. But without fail, the approach of ABM usually always remains pretty consistent. ABM is all about meeting the right buyers at the right time and in the right place. But I actually think there's a fourth dimension to consider now, and that's really about meeting your audience in the right way and leaving that memorable impression through your ABM experiences. In my opinion, you can't do ABM without getting personal. And so I'm fired up for today's guest who will actually show us and teach us how to create those omni-channel experiences so compelling and so personal, you'll actually leave your audience feeling some type of way about your brand. So here to talk more about leveraging personal experience moments inside of your event marketing and ABM strategy is Elise Hudson. In Elise's nine to five, she is an enterprise ABM experience specialist at Adobe, but there's more to Elise than just her professional responsibilities. Elise, why don't you tell the folks listening in at home more about your five to nine interests? What makes you you? Sure. Thanks, Nina. I am super excited to be here. I love to cook outside of work. So anything, trying new recipes. Um, I've kind of done a bunch of different foods from creme brulee to pastas to steaks. So kind of all over the board, but that's really what I love to do in my five to nine. I love that. And you were actually a part of Alice's Universe event last year, and you whipped up some really yummy treats that folks could make while they're all working from home now. Is there any dish that you're like, I have not yet mastered, but I'm committed to 2021 being the year it comes to life? Ooh, That's a good one. I, so actually I was just thinking about it this weekend. I really want to try to do some more curry recipes because I like curry. And so for me, I really want to go out and try some more curry recipes and try to master that because I haven't done that yet. I love that. Do you have like a flavor or a place you've had it before where you're like, that's the flavor profile I'm I'm striving toward? (laughs) You know, I, I don't have a particular one in mind. I would say that, um, you know, my family and friends are probably my biggest (laughs) judgers on if this is successful or not and just based on the foods that they've had so I think I I usually leave the critiquing up to them to let me know if it turned out okay or not (laughs) and I'm sure for better or worse they really give it to you straight right (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah, they, de- they definitely give me their full opinions, that's for sure. <laughs> well, today's conversation won't be as much of a firing squad, I promise. Uh, we'll make sure that everything's really tasting good, what we will cook up today. But I think it'd be helpful for folks listening in um, to hear what exactly you mean when you talk about an enterprise ABM experience specialist. Like, what does that mean in the context of Adobe? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, For me, it really means I kind of wear two hats in the role that I sit in. So I manage our mailer programs, and then I also manage our experiential events. So for all of the programs I manage, it's really about personalization and that next level personalization. To explain it in the sense of mailers, that for me is really in the sense of, okay, where are the gaps that we need to be filling? And what are some amazing mailers that we could offer both seasonally and then always on that our sales teams have access to? And so for the seasonal ones, it's really thinking of, okay, here's an item that we want to send out. It's completely custom. The landing page looks different. The copy looks different. Um, and then the whole experience that they get itself, you know, it's, it's unique and it ties into that particular time of year. And so for me, that's what I think about for mailers. For experiential events, we really think about, okay, how do we want people to feel? What do we want them to take away from this event? You know, if, if people get on a call with us, we want them to leave smiling, happy, and just having a good time. Because for us, that, that's what's considered a success, at least in our minds. Because uh, then that, that makes the relationship all the more powerful. When they come to these events, they feel something, they experience something, and then they come back and engage more with us. And I think that that's really important. And when we look at experiential events, you know, it's looking at what else is on the market and how you can think of where, what are the events that are missing and where can we add those in so that people come to our events and then get to experience and feel what we're hoping that they feel. I love that. The way that you 
like your your number one priority when you sit down to create these you know account specific plans is you're like how do we want them to feel you know what's that intangible sentiment that we want to leave that audience with i think that's such when i was kind of talking about that missing fourth dimension in some abm strategies it's really that intangible that feeling that emotional resonance that you're able to successfully deliver virtually to an audience when you don't yet have the luxury of being back in person when you're when you have that level of focus is that is that a hard thing to sell internally? Um, sometimes it can be hard to quantify how people feel about an event afterward. Talk to me a little bit about how you and your team, you know, lobby for that importance in your planning. Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think that, you know, it does, it is a little bit of a learning curve. I think it does take time to adopt that mindset of, okay, here's what exactly we want people to feel versus, you know, it's, it's different than a content event where this is a particular piece of content that you're sharing out. And this is exactly what you want people to learn. It's a totally different mindset and a totally different way of thinking. And so it does take a little bit of time to express, okay, here's the idea and here's the specific topic that we're going to focus on and here's why it's important and here's why it'll work. And, you know, I think last quarter was our first quarter kind of experimenting with that and getting to understand, okay, here's where experiential works and here's where it doesn't. And for us, I think, you know, after the event where we, when we're getting feedback from customers, it's really positive and they're super excited and you can tell in their responses that they felt what we wanted them to feel. I think that's a win for us. And for us too, when that comes in, then, you know, the team starts to understand, okay, here is what it's supposed to be like, here's what we're getting them to feel. And here's the response that we get. And I think that that's, that's really important. Uh, just because if, you know, someone's not used to this type of experience, um, then they don't really understand exactly what you're going for. And so we have taken a lot of time just to explain, here's what the event looks like from start to finish. Here's what we're visualizing so that you can kind of picture it and understand where we're trying to go from here. I love that. I have so many questions to ask you. I love talking <laughs> about this type of stuff. So um, before I kind of get into like the methodology about like, how do you really create these experiences start yeah. to finish and everything in between, talk to you. You just mentioned something that caught my attention and you said um, when experiences work really well and when they kind of fall down or they're not as great as they can be, what are some attributes that make up a really successful experience in your mind? And what are some of those attributes of ones where you're like, you know, that, that kind of hit the mark or it didn't make them feel the way we wanted it to make them feel? Yeah, I think the really key piece to making sure that they feel what you want them to feel is conveying the intention at the beginning of the event. And that's something that when we work with the vendors that we work with, when we work with the other groups that we work with, that is something that they're really great at doing. And I think when you start off the event with the intention, so they know, okay, here's what I'm coming into. This is what I'm going to experience. And this is how I should leave. Uh, feel when I leave. And so I think it's really key to start off by letting them know what's the intention, what's the purpose, what's the meaning behind this and why you're all here. Um, and just to make it super clear, because, you know, we try to make that appear on the form and through the messaging that we send out as well. But I think, you know, starting off the experience that way and just letting them know uh, it really helps to guide them. And I think for some of the experiences, when we haven't started off in that particular way, it can be kind of just uh, confusing or you don't get those same level of engagement. Because I think when you start off with the intention and you get really people excited about that, then they engage more. They're more interactive in the chat. They're more willing to be on video. And that's huge. That's really positive. I love that. That you you can't be intentional enough when you're putting like premium dollars on the line to create these really compelling experiences and i think if you have that level of intentionality with every decision the planning team makes all the way from like the pre-event during event and post-event framework it will shine through right the devil's in the details at that exactly. point Talk to us a little bit, your methodology or the framework maybe that your team uses to make sure you are actually being intentional with every decision you make throughout that entire process. Yeah, so for us, it really starts from the brainstorm. So when we initially think of ideas, we do a lot of research to see, okay, what else is on the market? Because, you know, chef events, wine events, cocktail events, they've all kind of happened at this point. Mm -hmm. And so what can we bring that's unique to the table that'll get people to engage with us? And that's kind of how we think of the initial brainstorm is where are the gaps and where could we add something unique and different that doesn't exist? And then from there, we really meet with our vendors and our partners that we work with to find out, is this feasible? 
well, is this something that can happen? And from along there, we kind of design the experience. So with our experiences, we actually send out what we call experience kits, where it has all of the supplies that they need to enjoy the event at home. And so it's thinking of what's going to be in that kit, how does it align to the experience, then looking at the invite and thinking, okay, how does this align to the experience? Because really the invite is the first part of the experience. And we think of it as an extension of the experience. It's not just an invite that they're sent that's like, oh, cool, I got this, I'm going to sign up. It's, it's really that first moment where they get to interact with the experience. And so it's thinking of that as well. And then from there, we think about, okay, what follow-up do we want to have after? How do we want to engage with them after? And, you know, for, for one of ours, it was really just adding on to when we did this particular date night event, we wanted to send a champagne bottle and champagne flutes after that let them know that they, the event's still happening. They can keep going even throughout the weekend or whenever they want to share that next experience with each other. And so it's thinking of how can each piece be intentional and really make that moment more special. Um, and so that's kind of how we think about it from start to finish, just with the initial idea of research, then with looking with our vendors to see what's feasible and possible, and then examining each part of the event experience to make sure it all lines up together. I love that. So in that initial brainstorm or when you think about, you know, what is the type of experience we really think would draw the audience we want? Is there any sort of feedback loop between you as the host and your audience members to gauge their interest and in what they might want to self-select into? I mean, at Alice, we talk a lot about that concept of five to nine and what makes people people outside of their corporate responsibilities. How do you use that to help infuse and inform what you choose to create? Yeah, that's a great question. For us, it's really about going to our internal teams and our internal stakeholders. So it's aligning with the different teams internally to make sure, is this something that's going to be of interest? Is this something that they're looking for uh, to make sure that what we're putting out does match their needs? Because if it's not, then how can we tweak it? How can we adjust it? Or where can we make changes? And so it is really going to both through email and actual meetings, going to those internal teams, getting feedback and understanding, okay, here's where the gap are that we still need to fix. And, you know, I mean, at this point, we're still learning it, even in this quarter, finding out, okay, this works, this doesn't, or here are certain pieces that we need to add, but it's great because it helps improve the events for the future. And so I think, I mean, you can never get enough feedback. I feel like there's just always more room for improvement. <laughs> I, I love that. And I also, when you're talking about that methodology or the way that you approach the planning cycle, what you had mentioned that the pre-event experience and the post-event experience are just as important, if not more, than the actual experience in and of itself. Do you think there are other components to an event that are underrated or potentially not as much intentionality as put behind it, where if the host, you know, put a little bit more effort or made that a bit more of a focal point, they'd really see some, you know, stronger outcomes? Oh yeah, absolutely. I One of the key pieces that I have learned through this whole time is that you can never send a Zoom link or whatever you know, the platform is that you're hosting on enough because there's always people who just for some reason misplace it or it gets lost in emails. And so I think even then just having a positive experience so they can easily access the event and get on, that's a huge first step. Uh, for us, we also think about it in terms of, okay, what do we need to do before the event to ensure that everything runs smoothly? And so for all of our events, we get on at least 15 to 20 minutes early. And, and that's in the virtual world. Obviously, if it was in person, it would be a little different. Um, but at least for virtual, we get on 15 to 20 minutes early. And before then, our vendors are even checking, is sound okay? Is lighting okay? Is this working? And so that we can work out any kinks so that as soon as customers or prospects join, they get the best experience possible. I love that. I think that accessibility is so key. Um, you know, in-person experiences had their their own set of challenges and things to be mindful of, but those don't always translate to virtual hiccups that you might want to prevent and create as an accessible of an experience as possible for that audience. Are there certain things, Elise, um, whether someone is in a newer role and they're just really starting out on this experiential event strategy, or they are a tried and true, um, you know, business executive who's been doing it for years, are there tips or things that you'd recommend those people consider in order to create the types of experiences that you and your team have been able to deliver on behalf of Adobe? 
Yeah, I think the biggest piece and, you know, kind of what we talked about earlier, what what is your ultimate goal and what is your intention? So I think that number one top of mind always is thinking of where exactly do you want to take this? How do you want people to feel? Do you want people to be engaging, smiling, laughing, interactive in the chat? Is that the goal that you're hitting or is it more a content event where you want them to consume the content and take notes? And it's, you know, it's two different experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I think looking at it in that sense is key and is important. I think another aspect is really thinking about how can you personalize it so that it doesn't feel like that it's going out to so many other people and they're getting the exact same experience. Even if they are like just the personal moment of getting the experience kit delivered and having that or the personal invites, for instance, all of our invites are sent out directly from our sales team for these events. Mm -hmm. So it is something where there is that personal touch, whereas some of the other programs, it's a different setup. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's huge as well. And I think, you know, thinking of it in the sense of, Three, looking at the research and seeing where else there are events on the market, seeing what's been done so that you can ensure that you're going to get a uh, great audience and a good group of people and ensure that you get the maximum amount of people. So you're not just wondering, okay, is anyone going to show up? Are people going to enjoy this? Because I, you know, with events, you always have that gamble. It's like, what's, what's the rate going to be for people to attend? And so I think, you know, doing as much research as you can as possible in the beginning pays out so much in the end if you go in and do that initial research. I love that. And what you had just mentioned, one of those key tips of thinking like through all the different inflection points in the experience to create that really personal moment. I think when sometimes folks hear that they, their head automatically goes to scalability and they're like, I can't scale, making sure that, you know, there's so much continuity in, the, in those personal moments. Maybe share a little bit about how you can actually leverage technology to help streamline some of those processes, but then also some of the things where you're like, you just can't scale that level of personal, but it's worth it if these are your top tier, tier one ABM accounts where you're looking to make that type of investment. Yeah, so actually for my mailers hat, that's a great question. So I actually do programs that are at scale. Like for instance, we ran a holiday mailer that had several hundred um, mailers go out. And so with that, we use technology, Alice. Um, where we send out our mailers through. Um, and really for me, it's about thinking of what pieces we can plug in to make it personal. So adding in the, I forget the name of it, but the name, so it shows the person's first name and last name, um, adding in that, adding in a custom subject line, um, adding in a note for the whoever sends it, whether it's the BDRs, the AEs, whoever's sending it out, adding in a note where they can personalize. So we have the messaging templates that I create, but then leaving room for them to add something in to add that personalization. And so for this in particular, you know, it goes out to several hundred people, but it may not look the, the same to every single person because there are those little elements that add in that personalization. And in, in addition to that, when also thinking of the boxes that we sent for our holiday mailers, so like I mentioned earlier, we, we do custom boxes. And I work with a vendor to select a few different options so that it hopefully appeals to a broad range of people. And so when looking at those boxes, it's really thinking about, okay, here's how we can customize to make each person feel special. Um, and with that, we also send handwritten notes with each of our boxes. And I think that that adds that next level touch that you may not be expecting, but it happens and it has the person's name. And I think, you know, even having someone's name and making it feel more personal really goes a long way, especially when you're trying to go at scale. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And I think, even components of that experience where one might not consider like who the invites look like they're coming from. Are they coming from somebody they're familiar with or recognize their name um, or their uh, the language that you put in the invite? Does it sound like that person actually crafted that even if multiple people get it? I think those are great ways to leave that lasting memorable impression but also do it in a way that's scalable where you're able to repeat it for multiple audience members. At least we're coming up on time here. I have so many notes personally that I'm going to take back to our ABM team to start thinking through experientially. But any last words that you would leave people who are looking to create more investment around experiential events and experiential marketing for their target accounts? Yeah, I will. Thank you so much for having me first off. Uh, but you know, I think there, there really is something to experiential events. It really allows people to come together in a unique way 
that is not like other events. And it allows them to get a break from everything else going on and to really focus in and network and engage with everyone on that call. And so there is tremendous value and just, just the response rates that we've seen on our experiential events. It does pay off. And I do think that for our mailers too, adding in that personalization really helps shine through what we're trying to do as a company and a whole, as a whole. And so I think that that's really important. I love that. Yeah, there's, you can't state enough how important that lasting impression is for your brand credibility um, and the experience that you want to leave your key audience with. So Elise, thank you for being on Office Hours. Uh, you've definitely shown a light on things that I personally did not learn in the classroom coming up on the ropes of marketing. So thank you for your time. Uh, and if folks wanted to connect with you, what's the best place for them to do that? Absolutely. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I am always available to respond to any questions on there. And thank you so much, Nina. Thank you, Elise. We'll talk to you all soon on the next episode of Office Hours.